the last talk, a brief talk, uh, we come back to HIV. And we have uh, Siddharth Day from UC Berkeley. And he'll be speaking about uh, chromatin accessibility of the HIV promoter and how it sets a threshold for NF kappa B activated expression. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for those of you who are still sticking around till the very end. Uh, and I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work here. Uh, I'm a graduate student in David Schaefer's group, uh, and I'll be presenting uh, a little bit of what I've been doing on how the chromatin uh, regulates viral gene expression and uh, what that means for viral latency. Uh, so very briefly, uh, a little bit about chromatin. Uh, so the fundamental uh, unit of chromatin, of course, is nucleosomes, which consists of an octomer of these four core histone proteins around which you have around 140 base pairs of DNA wrapped, and you have these histone tails that are heavily post-translationally modified uh, that have been shown to be correlated with either active uh, gene expression or repressed gene expression. Uh, and so a very simplistic view is, uh, it is uh, people have shown that uh, when you have the, uh, certain methylation marks, for example, uh, certain uh, modifications such as methylation marks uh, is correlated with loss of gene expression, whereas certain other marks uh, such as acetylations have been uh, correlated with active gene expression. Uh, similarly, uh, the nucleosomes that are shown by spheres here are extremely dynamic structures, so you can have um, high order chromatin structures that prevent transcription factors from binding and therefore preventing uh, activation of gene expression, or these nucleosomes could get evicted, which allow transcription factors to come in and activate gene expression. And so in studying uh, in the context of HIV, uh, as some of the other speakers earlier today mentioned, HIV uh, integrates randomly within the host genome, or, pre, uh, or sort of randomly. And so uh, one of the questions is, depending on where HIV integrates, how that regulates gene expression. So that is one of the questions that I was trying to answer. And the other question that I was trying to answer was uh, sort of understanding fundamental eukaryotic gene expression and understanding how uh, uh, availability of transcription factors and uh, quantitative features of the chromatin environment together regulate gene expression. And so some early work done uh, around more than a, a decade back showed that, for example, when macrophages cell lines uh, were stimulated uh, and the expression of inflammatory genes was monitored, uh, some genes, uh, such as uh, MIP2, activated almost immediately, whereas certain other genes uh, such as MCP1, activated at a later time point, and these were correlated to differences in transcription factor binding, which in turn were uh, correlated to certain differences in the chromatin environment. And so while these initial studies showed the role of chromatin, environment, uh, chromatin in regulating gene expression, uh, what is not clear is some of, since all these genes have different promoter architectures as to the role that uh, the chromatin, uh, chromatin uh, and the promoter architectures together play in regulating gene expression. And so uh, we made use of HIV. Uh, we thought that HIV would be a great system uh, to study this. Uh, so as I said, HIV integrates semi-randomly within the host genome. Uh, and you can think of different situations that might arise. So in one case, uh, you might have HIV integrated into a very closed or heterochromatic region, uh, which means that an important transcription factor called as REL A uh, fails to bind to the two uh, sites that are present in the HIV promoter, which means that the nucleosome that's present at the transcription start site sits here, uh, uh, sits, continues to sit uh, at the transcription start site and prevents activation of gene expression. On the other hand, uh, HIV could integrate into a euchromatic region uh, where RELA could then bind to the transcription, uh, to its binding sites, uh, recruit the host transcriptional machinery, and activate gene expression. And so essentially, uh, what we were trying to do in this work was trying to sort of fill in this space where we wanted to understand how transcription factor availability and features of the local chromatin environment could together be used to predict uh, probability of gene expression and how those influence viral latency decisions. So to do that, we made use of two uh, in vitro models of HIV latency that have previously extensively been used uh, in literature. Uh, one is called as the LGIT, which uh, uh, in which you have the minimal positive feedback loop of, uh, uh, in HIV, and the other, uh, and the other uh, uh, in vitro model that has been used is the JLAT model, which is the essentially full-length HIV with mutations in ONF and NF. 
And so we took uh, phi clones from each of these two vectors. And uh, under basal conditions, they show no GFP expression. Uh, but when we stimulated with them with TNF alpha, which increases the level of Rayleigh in the nucleus, we see there's differential activation across these different clones. And so we hypothesized that this differential activation was essentially pro uh, due to different epigenetic modifications at these different integration sites. So I should say that all these clones had, different, had unique integration sites. Uh, and so to, to see if there was any epigenetic uh, differences in epigenetic modifications, we first stimulated them with different uh, small molecule inhibitors, such as HDAG, uh, DMT, or HMT inhibitors. And there's a lot of data on this slide, but what I want you to take away from this is essentially that we again found this differential activation across all these clones, uh, suggesting that these different integration sites give rise to different degrees of chromatin repression, uh, which, uh, which possibly explains the differential activation to TNF alpha. To study, so to next study how rel A, uh, to systematically study how rel A regulates gene expression in the context of HIV and, in, uh, and chromatin, uh, we created this uh, vector, uh, which was a doxycycline inducible uh, vector where uh, Rele and M cherry, where we had a fusion of Rele and M cherry. Uh, and uh, this essentially shows that with increasing level of doxycycline, uh, we can get increasing level of this fusion protein. And so we went ahead and inserted this vector into all the 10 clones that I showed you earlier and monitored uh, increases in GF, uh, GFP expression from the latent HIV clones as a function of the level of transcription factor RLA. And for all these clones, uh, we found the sigmoidal response. Uh, and one of the features that, interesting features that we observed right up front was that you can see that all these sigmoids seem to be fairly similar, except that they seem to be shifted along the x-axis. Uh, and so what we went ahead and did it to quantify this more carefully, we fitted them to a Hills equation uh, and, uh, and derived two, two parameters. One, what we call as the induction threshold, or is the level of transcription factor that is required to initiate gene expression from the HIV promoter. And other is what we call the activation coefficient or the Hills uh, coefficient uh, which essentially is a measure of increases in gene expression once transcription is initiated. And so essentially, as you can see from these sigmoids that are essentially parallel to each other, the activation coefficient across all these clones were fairly flat, uh, whereas there was a six-fold difference in the induction threshold, uh, suggesting that integration into different sites, uh, into different uh, uh, chromatin uh, locations, uh, results in uh, differences in the level of transcription factor LA that you require to initiate gene expression. So to study the chromatin environment more carefully and systematically, uh, we did DNS1 sensitivity assays. Uh, and what we found for these different clones was there was a large difference uh, across all, suggesting that there were uh, differences in the chromatin environment for these different clones. And then when we correlated that with, uh, and, so we, uh, and so essentially we call these DNS sensitivity results as the heterochromatin fraction, imp uh, implying that clones that have higher heterochromatin fraction are integrated into more closed chromatin regions. And so what we found uh, was this positive correlation between the induction threshold uh, and heterochromatin fraction, implying that clones that are integrated into more heterochromatic regions uh, require higher levels of transcription factor to initiate gene expression, uh, whereas, as you might expect, the activation coefficient was not correlated to the heterochromatin fraction, uh, implying that once transcription is initiated, further increase in gene expression is uh, independent of the chromatin environment. So to further validate these res results, uh, we performed a chip for known molecular marks uh, of, act of repressive or activating marks. And once again, we found for the repressive marks uh, that increasing levels of induction threshold uh, 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 are associated with increased levels of repressive mark, whereas clones that have increased induction threshold have uh, lower activating marks, implying that clones that are integrated into more closed chromatin uh, require higher levels of Rele to activate gene expression. And finally, to show that the chromatin environment does indeed play an important role in setting this threshold of initiating gene expression, what we hypothesize is that if we take an extremely repressed clone and add a small molecule such as an HDAC, such that the chromatin then opens up, uh, such that the chromatin environment around this highly repressed clone then mimics that of uh, a less repressed clone. So for example, if we take clone 15.4, uh, stimulated with the HDAC inhibitor TSA, we see that the DNS1 levels for uh, the TSA-treated 15.4 is similar to clone D3, 
And then we hypothesize that once, if the chromatin environments are similar, then the gene activation functions too should mimic. And so what we found was 15.4 unstimulated shown by this black line, but once stimulated with TSA, uh, the curve shifts to this blue line, which mimics that of D3, which is shown by this gray line pretty closely, uh, suggesting that the chromatin environment sets the threshold uh, for activation of gene expression. And we went ahead and did this for different epigenetic modifications and for different clones, and we found a strong correlation uh, between the heterochromatin fraction uh, and the induction threshold. And so uh, very briefly, we also hypothesized, uh, and in understanding the mechanism of going from a basal to an induction state, uh, we hypothesized that all the different clones have different induction states. At the point of induction, the chromatin should be similar across all these different clones when transcription just starts getting initiated. And so when we take a subset of these clones that under basal conditions have different, different DNS1 sensitivity uh, values, uh, at the point of induction, we see that the chromatin tends to get equalized across all these clones. Uh, whereas when we chip for RNA pol 2 or phosphorylated RNA pol 2 uh, at the basal and induction state, we see no statistically significant increases, suggesting that the mechanism by which, the, uh, uh, by the, by which these latent clones activate gene expression is essentially by opening the chromatin in moving from the basal to, in the, to the induction state. And it's only after the induction state that the transcriptional machinery starts coming in. Finally, uh, the last slide where I'll be showing you some very prelim preliminary data uh, as to how we've been using this model to better understand uh, ways of reactivating latent clones. So for, uh, it has previously been shown that addition of uh, multiple small molecules uh, gives rise to synergistic reactivation of latent clones that can then be effectively cleared out. Uh, and so what, what we found was that uh, intermediate levels of uh, the transcription factor RELA often gives rise to very high uh, gives rise to this maxima of synergy, and we've been sort of uh, extending these studies to look at whether these uh, maximum, these very high values of synergies can be used uh, to optimally reactivate latent HIV clones. And so to uh, conclude, uh, what I've tried to tell you today is essentially that uh, the chromatin environment uh, in eukaryotic systems essentially adds an additional layer of gene regulation and essentially decouples transcription factor availability from increases in, uh, uh, fr uh, from increases in gene expression. And at the end, from all the data that we collected, we, we were able to reconstruct this three-dimensional surface uh, where we could uh, uh, essentially predict uh, gene expression as a function of the chromatin environment and transcription factor availability. And what we can see from this is essentially we can sort of come up with different uh, regimes of, uh, uh, of latent clones, where certain latent clones, for example, can be reactivated by small molecules that either opens up chromatin or by increasing levels of transcription factor, whereas certain other clones uh, require a combination of drugs to effectively reactivate. And so uh, further study, we're doing further studies to look at how uh, we can, re uh, using this model to sort of re optimally reactivate these latent clones. Uh, thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Oh. Of course, I should also acknowledge uh, uh, Dave and Adam have been great advisors, and this work was done in collaboration with Catherine, who was a postdoc, and she's now at Yale. Uh, and Jonathan, uh, who's a grad student in our lab, and uh, other members of our lab, and NIH for funding. Questions? So we added it, and essentially you sort of read steady state after three to four days. Uh, steady state expression. Uh, for, so for first half of the studies, everything was sort of after steady state was reached after four days. Uh, for some of those TSA, uh, so for some of those clones that we stimulated, for example, with TSA, the cells start dying off. And so for those, we sort of after one day, so example, when we did the DNS1 sensitivity, this, the cell starts dying. So basically, those were sort of done after, day, after one day of stimulation with doxycycline and TSA. So those measurements were done after day one day. Uh, so we didn't knock out P65. No, we just sort of overexpress. So we just worked with overexpression P65.
That was a very nice talk. Did, did you yes. try at all to see if there was any effect of TAT alone? There have been a number of papers from recently from Mark Weinberg's groups, for instance, showing that TAT alone can um, preempt the uh, formation of latency and halt it. And I'm wondering if any of your clones were reactivatable with TAT alone, which is post uh, transcriptional initiation. Uh, so. uh, we didn't do, uh, we didn't specifically uh, just reactivate with TAT. Uh, but what we did measure was uh, levels of TAT transcripts in this system, uh, where essentially TAT is expressed uh, once we add relay. And basically what we found was uh, sort of going from that basal to the threshold state, uh, there was sort of not so much, uh, there was very little expression of TAT. So uh, TAT was sort of almost undetectable. And so most of these differences that we see essentially arises from differential chromatin environments rather than differential uh, differences in TAT expression. I'm sorry, I was a little unclear. Maybe I should have said that since you're saying that the chromatin environment sets the threshold, is a control if you used uh, an additive like TAT, which was post in, uh, in initiation, it would be almost a, it would be essentially a control for the chromatin environment because TAT requires RNA polymerase to be initiated already in order to have an effect. So if you could show as with TAT addition that you weren't getting reactivation that would sort of buttress your point that chromatin environment is setting the threshold, right? It's, that's a good question. No, we haven't done, but of course, TAT has also been shown in some, in, so there's also evidence that TAT sort of influences things. Up, of course, TAT has been known, it's important in elongation, but there have also been some studies with initiation. Uh, for example, it's been shown to modulate serine 5-phosphorylation of PTFB. Uh, it's been shown to interact with chromatin modifying uh, Swiss and factors, and so that sort of makes uh, the analysis a little bit uh, not entirely not clear, just because it can, it's uh, because there's some evidence, for, and there was also uh, the uh, paper in uh, NSMB from the Frankel lab, which showed that TAT can also assemble uh, with the repressive complex, and so there is some evidence that TAT can also act at the initiation stage, and so that sort of makes the analysis a little harder. I don't know if that. Uh, kind of a, maybe a more comment than a question. Uh, in terms of the natural history of HIV, of course, T central memory cells are the th main reservoir. Uh, so now, how transferable is, and it probably is here, the idea of you know chromatin uh, transcription factors. But one thing, I think T central memory cells uh, don't have receptors for TNF-alpha. But I, I guess the answer to that would be there are other ways you can regulate NF-kappa B or rel -A. And you could, yes, and you could reactivate them. And then, yeah, so, yeah. Um, so we are doing some of these in primary cell cultures models. But uh, so the last slide was sort of very prelim preliminary data where we're using that to sort of transfer into uh, primary cells and trying to find out optimal drug doses that we could use to reactivate latent clones. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.